Today we are going to be discussing the main components you'll encounter in your robotics career at VEX and how to use them. So, why are we talking about this? We've all been in a state where we see tons of different parts and mechanisms and wonder what they are and how they're used. It's extremely important that we go over these parts and how to use them in the proper efficient manner in the world of VEX. As for motion, there's a lot of different parts that we use, most commonly on the chassis because it's known for, for those wheels that move around that robot. And we'll start with this part right here. This is a shaft collar, and this goes on all of the axles or shafts as we may call them, and they ensure that they do not move to the left or the right. This is a bearing flat. It is another piece of structure that we use on C channels that axles can go through, and then the other two holes are used for screws, and that ensures that the axle will not wear down on the metal and it'll reduce the friction on your chassis or anywhere where you have axles and gears. This is the axle that will go through that bearing flat. And again, that's just something to put your spacers, your gears, and your wheels on. These are some spacers. They are the nylon spacers, and you'll use these to make sure that your gears are lined up. And then you have wheels. Obviously, there's more than just the Omni wheels, but the wheels also go on the shaft, as you can see. There's that little square hole right there. Under the category of motion, there are wheel shafts, bearing flats, and spacers. And the main types of wheels that Vex provides which we'll go, we go more over those in detail in the chassis video. As for the functionality, they can be used for the chassis to roll around the field and form a roller for intakes and other mechanisms inside of the robot. The shafts are required to be used for the wheels and other rotating components on the robot. And that allows you to combine your gears, wheels, spacers, and have a moving axis for all of that. However, it's important that you use a bearing flat everywhere that you have an axle and this can prevent the surrounding C-channel from being damaged and ensure that your axis is lined up at a perfect 90 degree angle. So gears. There are all types of gears and backs, the big ones, small ones, thick ones, shaped ones, and even the metal ones, as you can see here. And they are used to transfer energy from the motors over to your subsystems and get movement. The first gear we have is the high strength spur gear. They're often used in high torque situations and usually do not skip as often as any other VEX gear. Skipping is when these little teeth kind of slide past each other without moving the next gear. The sizes that are sold in the high strength are the 12 tooth, 36 tooth, 60 tooth, and 84 tooth. And then you have these metal inserts right here that go into the square holes. They also can be used with high strength shafts or low strength shafts. That's the reason that these are here and these are here. As for the low strength spurs, they're similar to the high strength gears. These also can skip and will do, and will do so more often than the other high strength ones. But the benefit of using these is the size difference, the uh, thickness. You'll be able to construct a lot thinner gearbox, and it'll have slightly less friction than the high strength because of how much thinner these gears are. However, one of the things that you do lose is there's less mounting area. So if we look back at the other gears, there's much more holes on the 60 tooth gear to mount to, whereas on this one, there's only two holes. As for the bevel gears, they're a type of spur gear that kind of meshes with another bevel gear. The reason one might be using these is to transfer their motion by 90 degrees. As you can see, the power goes in this way and can come out that way. It's a perfect 90 degree angle. With the 45 degree angle on the gear, this right here, it allows for the gears to seamlessly and with constant speed transfer the energy over to a different direction. For the sprockets, they're not quite the same as spur gears, and they'll require a chain connecting them both, kind of like a bike chain. And what's good about these is they can travel custom distances around the robot. Where the other gears had to mesh next to each other, these can be any distance that they need to be, and you just add more and more chain the further they go. And they have an interesting trait where the drive gear rotates in the same direction as the driven gear. So the other spur gears, when they rotated and meshed together, one of them could rotate in this direction, which would be the clockwise direction. And then the other gear would have to rotate in the counterclockwise direction, where these both rotate in the same direction, regardless of which way it goes. These can also skip when this chain goes over a tooth. Weird. But it also holds the risk of if this chain snaps right here, then it'll no longer be a connected system. As for the worm gear, these are meant for really, really high torque situations and also accomplishes the same task as the bevel gears, where it rotates your motion by 90 degrees, as you can see this way and this way. And although these aren't likely to slip, they have such a high torque ratio where there could be a risk of snapping the driven gear. So there could be a risk of one of these teeth snapping off or bending the axle because of how much torque you have. And it's meant so that this axle right here, this horizontal one, is your drive axle. 
So this one should be the one that has your motor, your input, and then this should be your subsystem axle. If you go the other way, you don't have enough of a mechanical advantage or power to rotate this to go speed up really, really quickly. It would have, yeah, you can't, you just can't power the system from this axle. It has to be through this one. As for the ratchet and pawl, this is a mechanism that allows for it to rotate in only one direction. It's very useful on things like socket wrenches. And the ratchet rotates in this direction, right? As you can see by these little teeth that are angled, kind of like teeth. They're, they are like sharper teeth. And this shape right here in the bottom of the teeth is the same as the end of the pawl. And the pawl is meant to be tensioned into the ratchet, and that'll prevent the ratchet from going back the other way. So it'll easily slip past it as the pawl can move down over these lips. But when it goes this way, it'll just hit this flat surface right here, and then it'll stop the gear. And then over here, you can see we have a winch. The string goes around here, so as it rotates, it'll pull it kind of like a drawbridge design. And then we do have pulleys, which can be used for string or rubber bands for tensioning. Second to last one, we have a uh, rack and pinion. This gear system converts power from rotary to linear, and it can be used in subsystems like punchers or brakes. They require the use of sliders and rails, which is just this little fancy rail right here, and then there's a slider underneath. I don't know if you see it. So the rail is this metal part, and then there's this green part that's the slider in order to make sure it goes left and right in motion. And it allows it to go on a flat plane with minimal friction. Obviously there still is some because there will be rubbing, but it does use the this gear actually. So these gears are the 24 tooth gears and they aren't meant to mesh with the other spur gears. They're meant strictly for the worm gear and for the rack gears. And lastly, we have slip gears. Uh, these need to be created by you, the user, and it requires a spur gear, typically the high strength spur gears. I'm not sure. I, I found this picture, which is pretty high quality of the low strength ones, but if you make one, you should probably make one out of the high strength gears because these teeth could break off a lot easier. And these files, you can file the teeth down on these edges right here, where you have more than half or up to half of the teeth shaved off, causing the gear ratio to slip. So when these gears mesh together, right, and it reaches this slipping part, you could freely rotate the gear because the teeth aren't interlocked. And you could use this on something like a puncher or catapult, where when the teeth are engaged, it pulls back on a lever, and then once it gets to the slipping part, it disengages the gear ratio, causing the tension to launch the bar forward, until that slip gear rotates around and then catches again. And for structure, in VEX we have C channels, L channels, and one by bars, as well as gussets. C channels look like a C from the front where there's two holes in one hole, and then any length from one to 35, and that's going to be this piece of metal up here. As you can see in the ends, it kind of a bad angle, but it goes up, over, and down, making that little C formation that we all know and love. These are L channels, so this is a two by two. If you count one, two, three, four, so two by two. This is a five wide. As you can see, there's one, two, three, four, five, and it's still a large C. These are plates, which is just a five wide, but without those two sides, and they are bendable, as well as these, which are the one by is also bendable. And then you can be left with, if you cut a C channel down the middle, you're left with these one by one L channels, which are really lightweight, but can still bend easily if put under high torque or high compression and tension. As for the screws, you have 0 0.25, 0 0.375, 0 0.5, 0 0.625, 0 0.75, 1 inch, 1.25, 1.5, 1.75, and 2 inch screws. I know that's a lot. As you go through the year, you'll get more and more familiar with them. You do not use screws that are much longer than their intended purpose. For example, if you're screwing a bearing flat in, you're not going to want to use this two inch screw right here, you can see that the 0.5 inch screws are perfect and designed that way for the bearing flats. That's gonna be this one right here. And if you can, try to use the smallest screw possible for the job. This helps with uh, easy change outs and it makes them less likely to bend or break. And it'll ensure that you don't have any jagged edges to get caught on other components within your robot. So again, that 0.5 inch screw is the most popular one just because it's the right size for the bearing flat. And it's a good length to connect multiple pieces of metal together. And then another thing is the standoffs that we all know and love. Sometimes you'll try to screw screw into them and then it'll stop. That's because inside of the standoff, it's only 0.5 inches deep. So you can only fit screws of this length or less all the way in. So if you had like a piece of metal and a few spacers or something going through here, and then you had this much of the screw left, then that'd be acceptable to put the standoff on. But if you had anything up to like here, right, you wouldn't be able to fit the entire standoff on. 
As for the electronics, this is just the Vex V5 system. You have your brain, your download cable, your radio, your battery, the battery charger, your joystick, something to mount your brain to your robot. Of course, there are screw holes on the back that you can screw straight into the metal. You have your V5 smart motors, more mounting, some battery clips to hold your batteries in place, and then you have your wires, both for your battery and your smart cables. And the brain is part of the robot that stores all of your code, and it transports the battery energy to your smart motors, and it provi also provides you with helpful information regarding your robot. Connected to the brain is the battery, which has light indicators to tell you about its charge and is the only acceptable power source for the system. The radio helps you pair with your controller, giving you a wire-free connection from the robot to the V5 joystick, for those of you in competition robotics. And lastly, the VEX smart motors are used in order to create the motion for your robot. On a standard robot, you're allowed to use up to and no more than eight motors for the entire robot. And all of these electrical components will allow your robot to come to life with all the other mechanisms and parts that you're given. Thank you for watching.